this is a real uh, special treat for those of you who haven't had a chance to hear David McCord. You will, you're, you're, you're really open for a treat. And those of us who have heard him, we're also open for a treat because uh, uh, he is such an interesting person. And I'm not going to do a long interview, but um, this is our first inaugural economist in residence presentation. Um, and David McCord has been with us all week. Um, and he is an economist, economist, and a practicing economist. He's not just a theoretical economist, but it's someone who has taken his knowledge um, and brought it to bear on the real issues and problems of the day. And he's remarkable, I think, in a, in a couple of ways. Number one, um, he's very, very interested in content. He's won an Emmy. He's won other awards for actually producing stuff that people look at and that is very popular. With the other side of his brain, he's also very good with developing new technologies that transport content. And so he's been very much involved and very successful in the satellite and cable thing. And there are not many people in the world who are able to be successful both on the channel transport side and those who've also been able to be award-winning producers and writers of content. So I think you're in for a very special treat uh, for someone who knows the industry very well, operates very globally, um, across, uh, around the world. And so without further ado, let me introduce our economist in residence, David. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I, um, every time I hear economist in residence, I think that maybe I should buy a tie more appropriate of an economist <laughs> rather than this and look maybe more the part. Thanks, uh, Dean and, and uh, Chris Smith and, and Gabe. Thank you, Professor Kahn. Thank you so much for your hospitality. It's been a, it's been a great week. This is the end, as, as Dean Wilson said, the end of a, of a week here. And it's been, I'm, I'm actually overwhelmed with uh, my time here. It's been, it's, been, it's been fantastic. I spend a fair amount of time on college campuses throughout the year. Um, because my, my uh, 94 year old mother gave me two bits of advice. She said, number one, spend time with young people as much as you can. And advice uh, number two was, at all costs, don't spend time with old people other than me. So I, and this is a lady who, who asked for her 85th birthday, asked her what she wanted, and she said a treadmill. So she's not a normal 94 year old lady. But with that advice, I've been spending time on college campuses, and I was, because I grew up in Boston and I went to school at Georgetown, I grew up believing that all good schools were between Boston and Washington. So this has been a real treat to come out here. And, and, I, and I really am, I, I'm overwhelmed with the hospitality, the quality of the students, the quality of the administration, and the quality of the, of the professors. I met with a group of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurship professors, uh, and I had met with the same title, which is a group of entrepreneurship professors at, at uh, Georgetown just last month. And I think there was 15 in, in our group here earlier this week. I had one and a half down at Georgetown. So it was uh, one and a half because one was, was, had a full-time job somewhere else. So he just sort of came in and up. So this has been, this has been a real treat. Uh, my job here, I think, was to leave something behind. And I feel really guilty because I feel like I'm actually taking more from USC than I left. So I feel like you all got gypped a little bit and that I'm getting on the plane and heading back east and I've actually, I'm actually taking more than I gave, which I apologize for and it wasn't my intention, but it's the way it came out. So as Dean Wilson said, my name's Dave McCourt and I have, I spent 30 years in the telecom media and telecommunications industries and I thought that maybe what we do is we, we, I'd lay out a few observations that I have of where the industry is going and, and maybe by focusing on those observations with me, maybe it will give you an idea 
or at least you'll, you'll get my view at least of where the industry is going and maybe it'll help you develop your own view of where the industry is going. Before I do that, let me give you a very quick um, background so you can put my comments in some sort of context or perspective. As the Dean says, I started, uh, right after I got to Georgetown, I started in business for myself. I was lucky enough to invent a, a way to build cable systems that turned out to be sort of, uh, through the luck of the draw, r sort of revolutionary. And then I built my own uh, phone system. It was the first competitive phone network in the country, a little company called Corporate Communication Network. We merged it into another little startup called MFS. We created a company called MFS McCourt. We sold that to a company you've probably read about called WorldCom. Um, and, and luckily for me, we were able to uh, do something that Gabe's old newspaper referred to as an exotic financial transaction. So it protected me from the, the decline of, of WorldCom. I then went to Europe and did the same thing and eventually sold that business to uh, which is now Verizon. I went down to the Caribbean and built a TV station and a production company. I sold the TV station but kept the production company. And as uh, Ernie Wilson has said, we have been pretty lucky on the production side as well. And then I went to Mexico and built a series of cable systems from Hermosillo to Guadalajara came back to this country and um, built the company uh, up called C-Tech, which we eventually spun off into four public companies. So I've I spent my entire life around media and, and telecom, and it's both exciting and depressing that what I see happening in your world, in the media world, in the content world, in the world of PR executives and, and journalists and filmmakers is very similar to what I saw in the phone industry, which is what I think is worth talking about for a few minutes here. And I say it's exciting and depressing. It's exciting because if you can get a view of where the world is going by looking at the past, it makes you feel like you have an advantage. And it's depressing because when I reflect on it, I realize I've been doing this for 30 years, which is longer, obviously, than many of you have been alive. So that becomes a little bit, a little bit depressing. The introduction used to be that Dave McCourt's done this for 10 years, then 20 years, and now it's, it's, it's 30 years, which, as you have all heard before, it, it goes like that. So let me make three observations uh, this afternoon. One is the, mar the, the law of market elasticity that I've used to build every business I've ever built is actually broken right now. And I want to talk about that. I also want to talk about the fact that we're facing a Moore's law, law of information, and that there's an evolution of audiences from passive uh, uh, to very active. And the audiences I have in mind are obviously you students. So those are three things I like to talk about. So let's take them, let's take them one at a time. So I, I built my entire career around this, this law of, of um, market elasticity. When I entered the telecom business about 20, about 20 years ago, the telephone business was, was an historic industry in a historic time. Uh, but they hadn't invented a new product other than dial tone for those hundred years. And we used to like to say around the office in the early days that it was a, the phone company had a hundred years of history that had been unencumbered by progress. And we thought, we thought that that would give us an advantage. And they hadn't rolled out a product with the exception of push button phones. They hadn't rolled out a product in a hundred years. And then came deregulation, and then came competition, and of course that was followed by innovation, and that was followed by price reductions. When I entered the phone business, a phone call was 50 cents. When I got out of the phone business, it was five cents approaching free, which is what it is virtually now, which to make a phone call is free. But what's interesting about that is every time a phone, uh, a, uh, the phone rates would decrease in price, 50 cents, 40 cents, 30 cents. The usage would go up as the price went down, but the usage would go up by more than the price would go down. So what happens is the providers of service are happy, the consumers are happy, everybody's happy because the, everybody's getting a deal. The consumer's getting a cheaper product, and the provider of service is making more money. So the prices went down, but the usage went up by more than the price went down. And that worked flawlessly until phone, com phone calls got to free. Obviously, that no longer works at free. But what the phone companies, at that moment, every phone company had to make a decision, am I going to be an innovator or am I going to be a seller? Many of them were sellers. You, you don't think of this now. You might not even know this now, but there were thousands of phone calls in America when I started in the business, and now there's just a handful. And many of them merged into other companies. Many of them sold, and some of them became innovators. But those that held on to this archaic concept 
that this thing here that we call a phone was actually for only making phone calls obviously ran into trouble because this little device is, is for many, many things in addition to or instead of making a phone call. And if you go back to the beginning of modern time, you go back to when fathers would tell their sons stories and that was replaced by handwritten books, more content, right? Uh, when, when books were, went from handwriting to type books, more content, to movable type, more content, vinyl records to tapes, more content, tapes to CDs, more content. Every time th that became easier, more efficient, and cheaper, and better to distribute the content, there was more content. But everybody, the provider of the content and the consumer benefited. So, because prices, like I said, prices went down, but the amount of content went up by more than the prices went down. Now let's fast forward to today. Where are we today? Right now we've gone from shrink-wrapped CDs to digital downloads. And they're still easier, more efficient, cheaper, and better, just like since the beginning of time, with one exception. With one exception, which is revenues are down. For the first time, digital, digital revenue is actually down. So if you look at the financial reports, excuse me, if you look at the financial reports of time one or last quarter, you'll see that digital revenue is down. Now, why? because you guys don't want to pay for content. Why do you not want to pay for content? Because you have decided that it's no longer scarce and it's no longer exclusive. And if it's not scarce and it's not exclusive, you're not going to pay for it. So it's, it's not really much more complicated than that, but music industry tried to sue you and that didn't work. They can yell at you, they can embarrass you, but that's not going to work. What they need to do is figure out how to build an economic model around that new reality just like the phone companies did. And if they don't, if they in insist on trying to change your behavior, in my opinion, they will fail. And that's why as journalism students or as future filmmakers or PR executives or anywhere in the content business you're going to end up, I'd urge you to study the phone companies because there's a lot of useful information, information in my opinion, in the evolution of the phone monopolies um, that you can use to follow what's going to happen in content. And I think that they need to adapt to you. I don't think that you need to worry about adapting to them. So that's ob observation number one, which is the market, the, this market elasticity that I used for, for my entire career is, is now broken, which is, you know, as uncomfortable as it is, it's, it's just a reality. Now, that brings me to my observation number two, which is you all know what Moore's Law is. Gordon Moore was a fellow California guy that, that uh, went to school a couple hours north of here, which was his, uh, one of his first mistakes. But then uh, one of the more, more uh, brilliant things he did was he came up with something called Moore's Law, which, is that, which basically says the number of transistors that can be placed on an integrated circuit double every two years. So mere mortals like me have simplified that to basically say that every dollar you use to buy a computer doubles, that you can buy twice as much computer for a dollar every two years. So if you spend $100 to buy a computer today and you want to spend $100 two years from now, you're going to end up with twice as much computing power. And it's actually more like 18 months now, but, but, but everybody's afraid to adjust Moore's Law because Gordon Moore is a, is a, a genius, so we just keep it the way it is, which says that every, every dollar will buy twice as much. Now, because we don't really look inside a computer, we don't really realize how dramatic that is. But if you applied uh, uh, Moore's Law to the automobile industry, we could buy a BMW for a little less than a dollar and a half. So that gives you an idea of how powerful Moore's Law has been, and it's something that we don't think about because we buy a computer, you know, it, it gets old, we buy a new one, and we don't really think about how that has changed the fabric of society. So let, let's look at um, Annenberg Law, which, yes, I just, I just named that this morning, but I think it has a nice ring to it, which says that the amount of video in this world will double every 18 months. So the amount of video that circulates throughout the world, uh, the Annenberg Law says, will double every 18 months. And, I th and that's not just... Um, pulled out of, uh, out of my ear. That's actually with a, a around academics, uh, I wouldn't say it's a, 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 uh, a, a robust amount of study, but it's not without some amount of study that, that I came up with, with that number. And it's, and it's going to continue for, for uh, quite a few years. 
And when I started that company I talked about earlier, Corporate Communication Network, I started it with a simple premise that the phone <coughs> network that Alexander, Alexander Graham Bell and, and the boys built had the um, intention to move voice calls, to move a phone call from person A to person B. And I had made the observation that more computers were talking to computers than people were talking to people. So I said, could I build a new network around moving data and would it be more efficient than retrofitting a voice network? And luckily it proved to be true. And then I found out, again luckily, that you could lay voice right over a data network and it would ride virtually free, which is what we call voice over IP. And the phone companies kept on trying to shove data through a voice network and they came up with innovative products like dial-up internet access, which we all know aren't very good. So, if you, if you now look at the networks and you recognize that 91% of the traffic in the world is video, you can see that there may be some problems. And if you, if you want to have an idea of how much video is out there, but if you were to stop the world from spinning today on April 7th and say, okay, from now till April 7th of next year, I want to gather up all the video in the world and I'm going to sit down, I'm going to watch all the video in the world from now to one year from now. It would take 72 million years to watch. So if you said, okay, that's more time than I'm willing to spend, so <laughs> I'll give it two years. I'll, spend, I'll stand in front of my computer for two years, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You could watch about a second's worth of all the video, all the video in the world, a second's worth of it. So what travels around the world every second. So I, I think we've established that there's a lot of, a lot of content, right? And I think hardware will keep up. And I think because of Moore's Law, I think that will be okay. I think the network will keep up in most developed countries. Storage is relatively free right now. I think software will keep up. But the issue, and the really interesting be issue, becomes how do we as humans keep up, right? How does our motherboard keep up with all this concept? Because, you know, we only have two eyes. We only have 24 hours in a day, and we only have one brain. And over recent generations, our brain has gotten a little bit bigger, but it has some physical limitations. It has to fit inside our head, and the head has to pass through a pelvis once every generation. So there's some <laughs> physical limitations. So to how, this is a fact. I'm just telling you how. So there's some physical limitations. But the Internet is limitless. The Internet is limitless. So the real issue is how are we going to separate the good information from the bad information? How are we going to separate the noise from the signal. Well, there was a guy in Boston, he didn't grow up in Boston, but he spent most of his time in Boston at a place that, that Henry Jenkins, one of your, your colleagues and one of your professors here, spent a lot of time at MIT before Henry came out here. This guy's name was Shannon, and he, he was never recruited by, by Dean Wilson, otherwise he would, have, he would have come out here. But he, in, 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 in 1948, that's not mine, is it? I don't think. No, mine's off. So in, 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 19, in 1948, he came up with an information theory. And it was a it's really the foundation of how we understand information today. So Shannon said, the information in a message is inversely proportionate to its probability. The information in a message is inversely proportionate to its probability. So in other words, constant noise doesn't have any information in it. It's just noise which sort of reminds me of what my mother used to call white noise. So there was seven kids, two parents and two grandparents. So with 11 in the family, you know, sometimes, you know, dinner time, I'd say, my, I thought we said, you know, we were going to have spaghetti. And she said, it's, you know, it's just white noise to me, all you kids talking. It's just, I can't, I, I, I can't possibly absor absorb it all. So, you know, we're, we're, we're having pizza and that's it. So this Shannon guy was a smart guy. And he's also the guy that said that all information can be reduced to a basic unit called a bit, which is obviously shot for a binary unit. And you all know what a binary unit is. It's, it's a message that's either yes or no, heads or tails, zero, one, on or off, which is how fiber optic cables work. Fiber optic cables are just tubes of glass that are hollow, and there's lasers on the other end, and those lasers go on and off millions and millions and millions of times a second. And in fact, I, I've stopped even looking at that, the, the technology, it's probably up to billions of times or trillions of times a second now. So that 72 million years of video can be reduced to lasers going on and off. Okay, that's, how, that, that's actually how simple it is. But 
If Shannon is right and too much of the same thing can be constant noise and therefore useless, I think the question is, are we in a situation today where you have so much information that there's no basis for what's right and what's wrong? And as information surges, are we going to be able to distinguish the noise from the signal, the false from the truth, the trivial from the meaningful, the yes from the no, or the very essence of what Shannon called the, the, the binary unit? Are we going to be able to separate the, the trivial from the meaningful when there's so much? And this is not a new issue. Professor Khan, Professor Smith, and, and your esteemed dean and I had dinner the night before last, and we, we were talking about this very issue, and we reminded ourselves that, that Plato was the one that said that books were going to create mental laziness, right? So this is not a new issue, and I, for one, would never have heard of Plato without books, and I don't know if any of you would have, so obviously books have not created uh, mental laziness. But you do hear constantly that, that your generation, as students, with texting and video games and Facebook is going to create antisocial uh, uh, attention and deficit disorder generation of, of, of kids. And I have two college-age kids, but I actually think the opposite <coughs> is true. I actually think the opposite is true. I actually think you do more in less time than my generation by a long, long shot. And, and, and just to give you, you know, a point on the curve, it took Gandhi 30 years to overthrow the regime. It took my generation 10 years to overthrow Milosevic. It took the Tunisians six weeks and the Egyptians 19 days. And we can't draw a, a straight line from Tunisia to Annenberg School, but it's indicative, it's indicative of how fast stuff, stuff works. I went to a meeting this morning at um, 8 o'clock at Fox, which uh, may have been the first time anybody came into Fox at 8 o'clock, but we went, we went, I went to a meeting there, and when I walked into the meeting, uh, the guy said to me, I heard that you said at Annenberg yesterday that people can do social good and still make money. And I said, yeah, why, do you have a kid that goes to Annenberg? And he said, no, I saw it on Twitter this morning. So we, and that conversation took place at, that conversation about a, a social good in a capitalist endeavor took place at a quarter of seven last night. So 13 hours later, uh, I'm at Fox and, and they've, they're talking about it, which gives you an idea of how um, fast your generation is, is, is moving information. So to me, the digital divide that you, that you often hear about is not really about rich or, or about poor. It's not really about uh, high speed or dial up. To me, it's about young versus old. Because where my generation sees a lot of meaningless disorder, you guys see excitement and engagement, which brings me to uh, my third and final point, which is involvement and engagement. So, excuse me, I've been here all week. I, I must be allergic to universities. My nose is running. So if we use TV as a, as a proxy, right, for all media, because media is content, is, it's so confusing to define content now because it, it, it's all sort of melding together. So let's use TV as a proxy. That we used to say that you, uh, you go to the TV to turn your brain off and you go to the computer to turn your brain on. And that, that was actually um, Steve Jobs that said that. And it, it may go down as the only dumb thing Steve Jobs has ever said because it's just not true anymore. It used to be true. In my generation, when you'd watch TV, there were shows like Bonanza and Leave it to Beaver and Happy Days. And in those shows, you, you know, Mr. Ed was a talking horse. And in Gilligan's Island, they, you know, they go for a three-hour ride and they're lost forever. And Fonzie could walk in and hit a co Coke machine and the Coke would come out, snap his fingers, the girl gets in the back of the bike. So we knew that was, that was not reality. At least not in my life, that was not reality. <laughs> so now, with American Idol, The Biggest Loser, The Apprentice, Survivor, when you watch American Idol, you know those people. They look like your cousin or your sister or your brother or your mother or your next door neighbor or your friend. When you see The Biggest Loser, um, you see someone else that you love that's overweight that you want to lose weight. So you're engaged with that show. And the next generation of TV will be much richer because the next generation will be 3D, number one. So you'll be with the characters. You'll get to pick the plot lines. So I may be watching a show and you may be, Francois may be watching a show in the same show that has different plot lines because he's adjusted his plot line. You will have 
a device like this that holds all your TV. So when you go into a hotel room, you'll take your TV with you and you'll watch your TV on someone else's screen. It'll be wirelessly connected and you'll get to watch your shows. This concept of 300 channels of TV bundled it together so you can watch one that you want is archaic and, and, and it's going away. It's the only consumer product, as we talked about in class this week, the only consumer product in the world that's sold that way. If I walk into a store and I say I would like a, a toothbrush and they say, well, you have to buy a, a comb and a tampon and a razor as well, at least two of which I don't need, you would not, you would, you, you'd say that's a ridiculous, a ridiculous concept. But it's, a, it's the only consumer product in the world that's sold that way. Why? Because 80% of the cable channels on cable are owned by the cable companies. So they own the content, so they want to keep you watching your, your content. And that's why you should study the phone companies, because the phone companies used to own the phone, they used to own the lines, they used to own every piece of the ecosystem. And in 100 years, we got no innovation because they owned all the pieces of it. But that world, that world uh, is gone, and everyone knows that except for, in my view, the old media companies. And I'll give you an example to show you how much I don't believe that the media companies yet know how much has changed. We all know Jane Leno and we know, we know Conan. If you want to watch Jay Leno in LA, you go to Channel 4. In, in, in almost every major city in, in the world, you go to 4, 5, 6, 7, some low channel, you find it like that. Conan is on channel 398 or 243B or something. It's, it's, it's in the bowels of the guide somewhere. Consequently, Jay Leno has twice as many viewers as uh, Conan. Consequently, Jay Leno gets paid twice as much as Conan. However, if you take all the content that's on Jay Leno's show over a 30-day period of time and the content that's on Conan's show over a 30-day period of time, Conan has twice as many people looking at that content over a 30-day period of time. So to me, it's more valuable. Now, Hollywood would argue, no, the advertisers are on network. Well, that's where they are today. But as I say a thousand times a year at my office, I say, if you want to know where the world is going, don't try to look to the future. Put yourself in the future and turn around and look backwards and try to build a plan of how present is going to get to where you are. And if you look at it, if Hollywood looked at it that way, if they put themselves in the future and they said, wait a minute, if there's twice as many people, even though the advertising money now is on the network, aren't the markets relatively, and if we go over to the economics department here at USC, aren't they going to tell us that the markets are relatively efficient over time? And do, isn't the money going to follow the people over time? So shouldn't I be figuring out how to build an economic model? around where people are rather than trying to move people to where I am? Well, that's the way I would look at the business and that's the way I think they should look at it. So how something is distributed and what kind of network it's on and what kind of networks it's on is really, is really the game the, it, in the consumer involvement and how you can drag your consumers in. Now, if you look at that Conan, uh, all the places that Conan content is, you'll see that those are Many of those are interactive sites. Many of those are sites where people are, are tweeting or blogging or, or, or interacting with them. So change of this magnitude is hard for anybody to manage. Change that's not incremental is very, very difficult to manage. So the, and the economic uh, equilibrium is being stressed. It's being torn. It's, it's being ripped. So this is difficult stuff. This is not, not a change of a little, a little change. This is what we refer to as a sea change. And if you live your entire life You'd be blessed to live through one sea change. And this, it, it, this is a, a change where all bets are off. And you as students are so lucky, so lucky, uh, because when I, if I went to the Annenberg School, when I graduated and I walked over to some building to try to get a job, I'd be competing with someone that's there for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40. A 70-year-old guy in the corner might have been there 50 years, right? So after 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years of doing something, even someone who's not talented can get good at it, right? A blind squirrel can still find a nut, right, once in a while, right? <laughs> so you can, when you're competing, you're a 22-year-old, you're competing against people that have been doing this forever. Now, that's a disadvantage to them because everything has changed. So you have as much experience as they have. 
And the only thing that youth has excitement and they have energy and they have enthusiasm, the only thing they don't have is experience. We talked about this in class as well, which is I can bring experience to you, but you, know, you can't bring youth to me, so you have the better end of the deal, right? So you have, the, the, you have an advantage. But now your advantage has been doubled because the experience that they have is irrelevant to what's going on in the world. So although I've heard so many students have come up to me and I've probably got 25 emails that says, you know, I'm worried that newspaper businesses, the newspaper's going out of business, this guy's going out of business, where am I gonna find a job? That's all good news because all, you, you can't compete against guys, or easily, guys being the Boston expression for meeting all males and females. We don't have y'all folks in Boston, so guys just means everybody. I don't mean to be politically and polite, but you can't compete with those people uh, without starting at the very bottom, right? That's why you have to start in the mailroom, right? Because you don't know anything and everybody else knows something. But now you have a totally equal footing. So there's more capital, there's more brain power, there's more creativity, there's, there's more effort following these new distribution models. And any time, I think in human history, more money is being thrown at it. So you guys have such a huge advantage uh, you should just make sure you go for it and don't worry about failing because failing when you're, when you're young is painless. It's painless. It's more painful when you're older, but it's painless when you're young. And America is the only country in the world that rewards failure. Every other country, I've had the pleasure of working in, in, in dozens of countries, the only country in the world that rewards failure is America. If you fail and you pick yourself up, um, everybody will think more of you than they will someone who succeeded time and time again. So it's the only country, so the fact that you are living at least presently in America and being educated in America, just go for it. And if you fail, what's the worst that can happen, right? You have to, you have to sleep on a friend's couch, which every one of you have done in the last week anyway, so it's not really <laughs> that big of a deal. So I, I would say go for it. Now, I understand the counter argument because I've talked to people in this town. The counter argument goes like this. There's so much content out there that the jewel of a content that's professionally produced will stick out. That's the counter argument. I, doesn't mean it, uh, I don't buy it, but that's the counter argument. And the reason I don't buy it is because even if it's right, the audience is so fragmented, you have to think in a new, a, a new media way. You have to sort of atom, atomize, that's a word, isn't it? Atomize. You have to atomize your, your content like, like droplets of paint and spray paint and make sure it shows up everyone, everywhere. Like, like your uh, professor, your, your colleague here, Henry Jenkins says, and if any of you haven't had a chance to take his class, you should think about it. Professor Jenkins calls it spreadable media. So the media has to be spreadable, and that's a new way of doing things. So once again, an advantage for you guys because as a new way of doing it, it gives you, you guys, an advantage. So, in summary, we have, we have tons of content, more than you can absorb. There's no exclusivity anymore, because you got, and consequently, you guys don't want to pay for it. But you want to be involved as much as possible. And companies will fight those trends, and they're trends, not fads. You follow trends, you're successful. You follow fads, it has an ugly ending. These are, these are trends. And companies that follow those trends will do well. And companies that fight them, you know, I think, won't do well. Companies that embrace them and build economic models around them will do well. So what opportunities are, are, are there out there specifically, right? Well, organizing and distributing and storage and, and being a curator, right? Being a curator of all, this, of all this information. Google's in the business of gathering up this information, but someone has to be in the business of making sense of it. Because gathering it up is one business model making sense of it, you know, doing what our, our friend Shannon uh, uh, taught us in 1948, which is separating the noise from the signal, that's a business op opportunity. Moving, manipulating, storing video, we know how much there is, those are business oppor opportunities. But, but the one that stands out the most to me is the business of deciphering the, and separating the noise from the signal. That's the business model that I think for you guys as um, uh, Annenberg, as future journalists, Annenberg students, as future journalists, as, as future media types. That's the business, I think, that you should focus on, the business of separating the noise from the signal. But I'm optimistic 
uh, about the whole, the whole deal. I mean, I think it will work out fine. I'm very optimistic for, for you students. I know, like we said earlier, that people say you don't pay attention enough, you don't read enough, you can't focus, you text too much. But, but I, think that's, I, you know, I, think that's, I think that's wrong. I'd say, actually, the system is wrong, not you. I'd say the system is wrong. The, um, I had a, a lunch with the CEO of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt not long ago, and he told me that textbooks are new versions of K-12. to he's, He has about a third of the market of K-12 to textbooks. A new textbook version comes out every seven years, and you can't really tell the difference from version one to version two, which means 14 years. So, so we're teaching our kids with textbooks that are virtually 14 years old, right? So Tunisia and Egypt are described in those, in 19 days, that Egypt changed forever. So enough textbooks are changed every 14 days. So obviously that world isn't, isn't going to live. So conventional wisdom that says that, that you guys are going to be crazy with all this texting, you know, I don't, I don't even know what conventional wisdom is, by the way. I'm not even sure. The, the, the lawnmower was invented before toilet paper. So that gives you some idea of uh, how smart conventional wisdom is, right? Um, so anyway, I, I'm, I'm optimistic, um, but then again, all short guys are optimistic because from my angle, the glass always looks half full. <laughs> but I, I, I would, um, I, I'd leave you with w one thing that you're fond with uh, saying around here, which is to fight on, and thank you for your hospitality this week. <laughs> Do you want me to take questions? Yes. Colonel of Iam, thank you so much for this uh, tour de force of uh, what's happening in the industry. You had uh, made a comment about how the future of content will basically be the one that we determine individually will carry it around in our little iPhone. Little yes. Little you also mentioned that there are unique aspects of the market that are unique to the United States. So what happens then uh, if you're trying to build global markets? Does that same, do those same laws and those same truths hold true if you're trying to do the same thing in China, in Africa, in Asia? Or are we creating a, an audience and a production and a distribution system that becomes so completely monolithic that there are no longer distinctions across Okay, what, what, what I think is the trends that I talked about, I think, are global. And I think what happens is the technology that implements those, that allows those trends to be a reality, is different. In other words, when you go to um, a country that has no landline service, the cell phone service seems to take off. You know, in, in Mexico, when I used to do business in Mexico, it would take up to a year to get a landline phone, but everybody had a cell phone. So the technology will take over. They have something now um, called spot beam technology with satellites. It used to be you'd have a satellite, you'd spend $300 million, and it would have a little footprint here, and you'd use up the footprint, and it would be gone. Now you can reuse the beams, so, you, so it becomes much more efficient. So when when the, there's times of days that people are using capacity and there's times of days when they're not, like during the night, right? So you can reuse those beams and put them somewhere else. So that is, as an example, I think what happens is the technology, men and women, will solve the problems so it can be implemented, but I think the trends are irreversible, in my view. Yes, sir. You talk about studying the, uh, the evolution of, of the phone companies. Uh, in which ways did uh, the phone companies uh, resist changes uh, that are similar to the way uh, all these media providers? Well, well, the, the, um, it, it, it really comes down to money, right? And it comes down to the fact that people almost always except very, 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 very special people will always do what's in their self-interest. And when, you, when the guys down on the third floor are coming up with all these cool ideas, the guys on the top floor that are in the executive offices get paid based on current 
what's happening today. So they get paid on getting money from Colgate Palmolive for Jay Leno tonight, right? So if they invest money, which you'd think would be logical, for the next generation to make the company healthy long term, like you see happen often in, in academic institutions, which is why they last so long, right? That's why they, you know, institutions like this have been around since the 1800s. But in business, if they do that, they put money on the guy, the 25-year-old guy who's working his way up, they put money in his pocket, going to reap the benefit from that. He's not, he or she is not going to. And unfortunately, the way the compensation system works, they always do what's in their economic best interest today. And it's unfortunate, which is why being an entrepreneur is so rewarding because you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about that. You can do whatever you think is right. So the phone companies, as an example, I'll give you a specific example. Push button phones, when, when I was your age, we actually used to have to have a rotary dial, right? right? You dial the phone number. Push button phones dramatically lowered the cost of making a phone call. They charged $2.50 a month for push-button phones. It took them 30 years to roll it out. So they were worried about making money today as opposed to lowering their operating costs. If they had lowered their operating cost, I never would have went in business because I built my system and I went to Wall Street to raise money and my pitch was these guys are, are, have, I can offer a product at a fraction of their cost and get a tiny bit of their business and still make a lot of money. And they rolled out push button phones and the next technology and the next technology and the next technology and invested that capital. The guys, men and women making the decisions that day might not have made as much money for the company that day and therefore, they personally wouldn't have made as much money in bonuses and stock options and all that stuff. But the business would have been healthier long term. And you, we probably will never be able to change the fact that humans, more often than not, will do what's in their self-interest. And so you can almost always count on a big company that has a dominant position will never be able to compete with a startup that's trying to take a, a small piece of their business away. And it's that small piece of their business that m makes everything unfold. It's like a little tiny bit of democracy or a little bit pregnant. It just, it, you know, it, it doesn't really work. It makes, it makes some sense just because they're so, they, they already kind of become what they are, so it's hard to start. So they're they've already made it, yeah. right? They already, they, and they're not willing to sleep on someone's couch. <laughs> And then that's the truth. They're not willing to take that chance that if their idea doesn't work, they're going to have to start over. And that's an advantage that you can play into, assuming you're willing to sleep on someone's couch. Yes, sir. I have a question about um, voluntary collective licensing. So the whole, uh, you started by talking about how we, people in this room have made up to leave the idea that you know, we'll be paying for individual content, but the industry is, continues to try various <coughs> schemes, legal and otherwise, to, to make that happen. You know, radio has had a system that worked for how to deal with that question for over 80 years, worked really well. And the idea was that the more people listen to a particular song, well then each radio station pays some money into a big pool, which gets paid back out to the, the labels and basically yep. the, the creators. And you know, a lot of really smart people have floated that idea as a solution that aligns all the incentives in the internet content game uh, except for the lawyers at the RIAA. So ISPs pay a small amount of money you know, per subscriber into a big pool which gets paid out to the content creators <coughs> based on how many times it's been downloaded. Um, what are the obstacles to getting from here to there? Well, um, I don't know all the obstacles but uh, all these good professors over here, like, like Jonathan and, and Francois and the, and the, that study this regulation will, but I will tell you why it hasn't worked to date, which is, there's one thing I, I disagree with what you said. I said, when you said that I said that you won't pay for individual content, I think you guys will pay for individual content. I think it's packaging it up 
and charging you $75 or $100 for something that you only wanted one piece is what pissed you off. Is the saying, here's 300 channels at $75 that made you say, that it's not that exclusive and that special to me because I can get all the individual discrete pieces somewhere else. However, had they, the content owners, early on said, we're going to sell everything a la carte, they wouldn't be in the jam they're in now because you would have paid 50 cents for Sports Center, which is great content. You would have paid 50 cents for HBO, which has some good program. You would have paid 20 cents for National Geographic, if, if that's what you want to watch, Nat Geo or, or, or something else. It's when they try to own all the content, be the distribution company, and force you into a bundle that made you decide that you could find the facsimile thereof, if not the exact content, the facsimile thereof on the internet. So if you can't find exactly what you want, you can find another version of it. So by not letting it become a la carte, they put themselves in a very, very difficult position to negotiate because radio is a la carte. Radio, you don't have, radio is, is, you turn it on and off, you only have to listen to ads, you're only paying for what you listen to. But when I pay for internet each month, what I'm really paying for is access to the vast global store of content, which as you said, is no longer thought of as scarce. I want to be able to just access whatever content I want, and I'm already paying for it. So isn't it a better model that aligns the incentives of the producers and also the consumers to say, well, just take a small portion of what I'm paying for already in my internet access fee, put that into a big pool, and then the more the content spreads, the more the producer makes, because we have very good tools now for monitoring. It makes, perfect, it makes perfect sense, but you can't skip by the fact that the guy that's selling you the internet owns 80% of those cable channels, and it's, if he or she subscribes to that theory, and you, as you said in your words, have this vast pool of information, you may not choose to watch his content. So it's a disadvantage to the guy that owns 80% of the cable content. It's absolutely a logical solution, assuming the world was made up of network companies and content companies. And the fact that they are together makes, and we talked about this in class this week, usually if a company has two cultures, it's very, very difficult to deal with, with competition. And I think that's what's going to be interesting to watch how companies that are, don't know whether they're a network company or an internet company deal with issues like that as well as all sorts of other cultural issues. Yes, sir. So, so it's interesting if you bring this answer to the one you gave earlier um, to the, the question about the telephone company, one of the things that uh, forced change in the telecommunication industry was the intervention of government that forced the monopoly to interconnect with the MFS and WorldComs that made uh, your businesses yeah. possible. Uh, in your last answer, you said one of the obstacles to what Sasha is proposing is that there, is, there are these uh, single companies that control so much of their content, so many of the channels, that they will object to, uh, to such an arrangement. Uh, looking at the past, as you suggested, what do you recommend government does uh, for the future? Well, I think, that, I, I think that, and I'm not a government policy you know, guy, if, so if I had time to answer this, of course, I would ask Jonathan for the appropriate answer and then I'd give it to you. But without that option um, available, I, I, would, I would say that, that the, their government is going to have to make sure that there is some level playing field for those that put their content and other people's content on the network. So if you want to build a network with your own money, and put your own content on it, I think you should have the right to. If you're going to build a network and put your content and other people's content on it, there's got to be a level playing field developed. And they're trying to do that, but the problem is, just to give you an example of a little bit of a technical problem, so they say that you can't, uh, for the last mile, you can't uh, discriminate, right? So if, if, so if level three is carrying Netflix traffic, you can't discriminate, right? So what Comcast did, was they said, okay, we can't discriminate for the last mile. Oh, but, oh, by the way, the only place you can interconnect is, in, is at Newark Airport. And to get to Newark, to Princeton, is $250,000 a month. But for the Princeton community, we're not going to discriminate. We're going to carry that Netflix traffic totally uh, at the same price we carry our own traffic. 
but we're not going to let you interconnect, right? So it's, if, I think the, what government should do is say that's be a level playing field. You want to buy your own network and pay for it, have your own content on it, that's fine. But if you're going to let, if you're going to have other people's content and your own, there has to be a level playing field. I think that's what they have to get to, right? And stimulate, I think the stimulus money should have gone to people that are working at the Annenberg Inf uh, uh, Innovation Lab and those kids in the Entrepreneurial Club and not gone to Hughes, DirecTV, Echo, AT&T, which is where all that stimulus money went. And that's, the, it should have gone to small entrepreneurial business, in my opinion. Any more questions? Yes, so, uh, my question relates to the previous discussion, but uh, you mentioned that you know, telecom operators control everything, uh, but it's problematic because there is no innovation, right? So uh, I'm interested in whether telecom operators should own the content. So, um, but there is a concern about telecom operators that you know they uh, they will end up being just a dump pipe. So that, do you think the table of that should not own any content or should it's okay to own? Well, I, if, if, if you're asking from a business standpoint or a regulatory standpoint or a practical standpoint, if it's a business standpoint, I can, I can answer it. From a business standpoint, I think that a comp it's so hard to run a company, you, you have a strategy and a culture and execution and the financial well-being of the company. To build a culture you want takes years and years and years. And a network company is a different culture run by engineers than a content company run by creative people. And creative people have to be managed very different than you manage engineers. So if it was me, I would want my company to be one or the other because I think it would be easier to have a company that everybody could be proud of and everybody could say, you know, we're doing great things and we're doing fun things and we're doing innovative things and I'm proud that I'm part of this company. I think when you start having conflicts is when you have two cultures in one company. And the balance sheets of each company have to match up to the strategy as well. So now you have a little bit different, you know, the balance sheet of a, of a creative company looks very different than of a network company. So my answer is if it was me, I'd pick one or the other and I would gather all the employees and I'd say, let's be the best XYZ on the planet and let's be proud of being the best network company or the best content company. That's what I would do. But people, you know, want to be everything, right? And it's, you know, it becomes, it becomes difficult. But that's what I would do. Take a perfect on chair for the last question. So two parts. One builds on what you just said. The other um, is um, what advice, what, what kind of competencies would you recommend that our students attain in this new kind of world? Because both on the journalism side of the school, with public relations, and, uh, communications, we're in the process now, Dave, of rethinking our curriculum. And so based on your own experience, what would you recommend to us that we study? Uh, the, the first question uh, addresses the one that you just raised. I had a, a conversation yesterday with a fellow who works with at one of the talent agencies in town. And I asked him exactly that question. And I said, well, there are two tracks in a lot of these industries, especially in, in this town. There's the suits, and there's the creatives. And usually, there are two different tracks. And the question I asked him is whether or not there would be enough effective demand in New York and Los Angeles so that at the crossover point, when someone's got to run a, a slightly more integrated company that makes good business decisions and nurtures its creative people, would there be a demand for a training program, an educational program, an executive education program that would teach the creative some, how to add and subtract and teach the suits how to distinguish good stuff from bad stuff? Well, so there's two questions, right? Yeah. So in the first question, um, I think, and I feel really strongly about this, and I actually, about my answer, and I actually think this is why I'm so impressed with the students at, at Annenberg, which I think the single most important skill for anybody coming out of school is the ability to communicate, the ability to 
figure out what your position is and communicate it in a way that makes the recipient of that communication understand it and each, when you're talking about an engineer or a creative person, you better communicate two different ways. And in communicating, I would add the ability to listen because what someone says and what they mean are two different things. And everybody in this room that's a married man knows that's true. So <laughs> what someone says and what they mean are two different things. I've been happily married for 21 years and, I just, and, and, I, and I've had, I, we tried to figure it out in class the other day. I think I've, I think I've hired 30,000 people in my career. So I've had a lot of experience in hiring people and, and I've brought up two good kids and I've been happily married for 21 years. And it's the same in your personal life it is in your business life. Being a, a good listener and then being able to figure out what the other person is saying and then articulating a, 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 a response that resonates with their issues. And I think that's why I'm so impressed with Annenberg is because these kids are drawn to communications anyway and I think that comes naturally to them. And I think that the second question, I think where, um, where a lot of times creative companies get crossways, I think is they, um, it's, it's fair enough to say to a creative group of people, we also have to make money and they'll respect that. And it's fair enough to say, we're in the, just like that young lady and I had a conversation yesterday about social change and I said it's fair enough to want to um, enable social change within a capitalistic endeavor. But where they get crossways, I think, is when, it falls back to my first answer, is when they don't think about how to communicate to those people because they have different values. Everybody has a different value system and when you don't relate to their values. When I talk to my engineers, and we have a big engineering center in Germany, we have a big engineering center in um, Edinburgh, uh, Scotland. And when I go into that engineering center in Germany, every man and woman in that room thinks, believes in their heart of hearts, that they are the best designer on the planet. Okay, and that's fair enough. And they also think the Germans happen to be, so by birth, they also have to be better than anybody else at, at designing. So I have to approach them around their reality and communicate with them around their reality. And the worst thing I can do to them, we talk about making money. I can talk to them about making money. What I can't do is put a dumb person in with them because I paid them less. So that's a language that I had to figure out that they know. So I can't say, if I get, it's a simple problem we're working on so I can get some guys that aren't that smart, some men and women that aren't that smart that paid less and I'll put them in with the smart guys and we'll have three bodies for one. Totally against everything and not working with smart people is like totally against everything, the value stream. So I think that when you're teaching, it's more than teaching people about adding up a column of nines, it's teaching them how then to communicate their values to someone else's without violating that other person's values. I think that's the part that's the tricky part that most people in um, finance, if you said that to them, they would be like, look, we're here to make money. Shut up, David. You know what I mean? This is like ridiculous conversation. We're here to make money. We're just going to tell them what to do. And you'll get, you'll get what, you, what you bargained for if you do that because they will go work for someone else that respects their value system. So I think that is my view on that anyway. Thank you. Well, I want to thank David once again for his... Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Well done. Thank you. Another home run.